what I'd like to do today is uh, introduce you to one particular experiment that I ran uh, that's part of a larger research agenda. And if we have time at the end, um, I'll go into an extension of this particular research uh, to kind of show you some, some other directions that I'm going with this, okay? And most of it in, uh, is very much uh, due to uh, the support of the Bedrosian Center. Um, if you're not aware of the Bedrosian Center, I, I'm taking it that most of you are, but if you're not, please go to uh, the Bedrosian website, um, which I believe is Bedrosian priceschool.usc.edu, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, you can find it. Uh, so uh, I do know most of you, but there's a, some unfamiliar faces here, so I just want to introduce myself really quickly. I'm an assistant professor here at the Price School. Um, my general research focus is, fo is on what ways administrative structure and political environments uh, influence the decision making of public administrators or their behaviors and even perceptions. And I have a lot of work that's uh, kind of in that vein. Um, but uh, a recent focus uh, is uh, kind of two different tracks. One is in executive and bureaucratic politics where I look at things like appointed leadership vacancies at the, in federal executive agencies. Um, I also look at goal setting as it, as it relates to these leadership vacancies. Um, distributive politics at the bureaucratic level, namely uh, looking at contracts as a method of pork. Estimating appointee ideology in uh, especially independent agencies. And uh, just going to start with some work with a, a doctoral student, Colin Leslie, on uh, how political environments uh, uh, might influence the decision to blow the whistle uh, and perceptions of whether or not they have been uh, unrightfully uh, persecuted for, for doing so. More towards this work that you'll see today is how various stimuli affect altruistic work behaviors. And what I mean by altruistic work behaviors are the types of extra role behaviors in their organization that go above and beyond the expectations of their role with the intention of helping the organization. And you can think of this in a lot of different ways, right? So teachers spending money out of pocket uh, towards classroom materials that they won't get reimbursed for, right? Um, the cop that buys uh, an at-troubled youth in his jurisdiction, uh, you know, a bicycle. Um, uh, are these, the caseworker that, that, that drives their, uh, their client to a job interview, right? That, that takes that extra time out of their job, not for the sake of performance, but for the, uh, for the sake of performance as the organization sees it, but for out of some kind of intrinsic altruistic motivation, right? And so I'm doing stuff on, in fact, teacher spending in the classroom. Uh, I'm also interested in this idea of pro-social motivation, uh, but measuring it implicitly as opposed to explicitly. And, I, and I'll talk about that at the end of this presentation. And then I'm testing that implicit pro-social motivation in actual work environments um, at medical schools with uh, certified nursing assistants, with public administrators in local governments, so on and so forth. But I'll talk about that later. First, let's get to this. This, uh, this particular work is co-authored with uh, my colleague and, and frequent actual co-author. Uh, we have at least two published things together, I think three, and we've got uh, quite a few things in the works. John Marvel at George Mason University, and Bo Wen here, a doctoral student at Price School. We know that government agencies and large civil society organizations are often driven by broad um, abstract social missions, right? And these broad missions present ambiguities in interpretation of those missions. That is, what goals to prioritize within the organization, how in fact they are articulated. And that leads to one party interest or patron that might look at organizational and contributing individual outputs as successes, whereas others uh, within that environment might deem those same outputs as relative failures. Um, this is true not just for public organizations, but again for large nonprofits as well. And as we know from, uh, uh, namely, Michael Lipsky uh, really presented this concept that there, there is no you know, end to the demand of social goods, right? 
You got a good education? Well, let's make the education better, right? Uh, you're delivering health? Well, let's make it, people can be healthier, right? Um, there can be always be more economic opportunity, so on and so forth, right? And so what happens with performance metrics is that rather than providing some objective means of evaluation, they can sometimes, and not always, it's not to say that, that performance metrics can't be impartial, but especially in public and nonprofit organizations, they many times can provide ammunition to one side of an argument uh, or the other, right? So a uh, basic example, think of the EPA, right? With the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, you have people who fundamentally think that the EPA should not exist, right? And then you have you know, uh, people that are very pro-environmentalism who think that the EPA doesn't even scratch the surface of what it should be doing, right? And then every opinion in between, right? That is to say, then, that there is a relative constancy of undue expectations in these sectors. And so if you're constantly put up against these undue expectations, right, and that negative performance feedback might be a relative constant, then what does this do to the employees within these organizations? Well, it's probably going to affect their morale. It's going to affect your ability to retain and recruit the necessary talent to deliver on some of these promises. And it can uh, probably lead to burnout within the employee ranks. And we know that both extrinsic and intrinsic motivations are expected to drive work effort in any organization, whether it's a private organization, public, nonprofit, it doesn't matter, right? But there's very little scholarship that focuses on the extent to which negative performance feedback affects work effort, right? Whether it stimulates further effort or it diminishes further effort, right? But especially lacking are the tests of durability or persistence of work effort, especially altruistic work effort, in condition, under those conditions of negative feedback. We know that organizational mission really matters, right? The EPA doesn't have a lot of libertarian economists you know, populating its ranks, right? People are pro-environmental within the EPA, or at least there's a tendency towards uh, that kind of view, right? And they self-select into, not just the EPA, but they self-selected into an environmental management major or an environmental science major because they were very much oriented with the general goals uh, that correlate with the goals of the uh, EPA, right? Um, and we know that it's important, especially in uh, the PMP sectors, that is public and nonprofit. So if I say PMP, that's what I'm referring to. But when we're studying this and how much this motivation matters, it's very difficult for us to establish a causal connection. Why is that? Because they've already been in the organization when we're studying them. We don't know, you know, there's a selection bias there, right? People have already gotten into the organization. We can't randomly assign organizational missions to their work context, can we? And so um, while it's been established in the literature that that these intrinsic values uh, afforded by the organizational mission can have a great impact on performance through elicitations of survey evidence um, and even be substitutable for extrinsic rewards, we still haven't really established these causal mechanisms, at least empirically, uh, to any you know, good satisfaction. Akerlof and Cranton are some economists who have formally established uh, this notion that an organization will function well, and that's any organization, will function well when it relies more on more than just monetary compensation schemes, more than intrinsic benefits, right? That mission match, right, as, as one example of an intrinsic motivation, is actually substitutable for these extrinsic incentives, that you can actually pay less uh, to somebody. Someone will be less motivated, perhaps, off of the amount of pay if the organization they're working for, uh, they really identify with the goals of that organization, right? So if, for example, public sector and civil society employees are less responsive to those <coughs> extrinsic incentives, 
Um, but there's some kind of intrinsic incentive that compensates for that disparity uh, between themselves and private sector organization workers, then we should be studying this, right? We should understand the extent to which that can be substitutable, so to speak, right? However, it's not just mission match that is an intrinsic motivation that we should pay attention to, right? There, in the public management literature, there has been a construct defined as public service motivation, which is uh, loosely defined as an individual's predisposition to respond to motives grounded primarily or uniquely in public institutions and organizations. And it has been established pretty well empirically that uh, those in public sector or nonprofit organizations uh, register higher on scales of public service motivation than those that are in private sector organizations, right? Um, and it has been claimed to be separable from narrow policy advocacy, that is mission match, right? Or more self-interested work motivations, such as ambition or these extrinsic benefits of how much money you make. Public service motivation probably matters, right? But w we argue, first and foremost, we think mission match probably matters as well, right? Uh, that people go to organizations because they believe in those organizations. There's lots of reasons that people select into different careers, mind you, but that this mission match might be a more kind of salient driving motivation than the generic altruism of public service motivation, okay? So if individuals are more motivated to public service institutions or organizations, they are also presumably more motivated to work hard on behalf of those institutions. And so in the work that I'm about to show you, we test work effort um, and we make negative performance feedback or failure, quote unquote failure, almost a near constant in this experiment. And we argue that constant or likely failure has some external validity to the context of public service uh, for the same reasons that I started out this presentation. And we argue also that PSM, that is public service motivation, and I'll refer to that acronym throughout, um, strengthens this relationship between mission match and work efforts. And it leads to persistent effort in an environment of negative feedback. So what we do is a real effort experiment. And I want to tell you that I'm going to try to get through this. And if, you, if we have some time, I'm going to show you an extension of this effort, OK? But first, just this experiment is a real effort experiment, which is uh, becoming more common in behavioral economics, social psychology, and public management, or, and generic management studies. Um, and in this real effort experiment, we first uh, expose our subjects to a survey, right? And we ask them a battery of questions, a well-validated scale of public service motivation that we take from Corsi et al. And other questions about their general self-determination, right? Like how much of a go-getter they generally are, right? If they're, if they're given a task, they'll complete it, so on and so forth, right? And a lot of other demographic and ideological characteristics. This is the validated public service motivation scale. It's 12 items. Typically, this, uh, this, uh, this battery of items is hypothesized by the people that developed it to load onto three different separate dimensions of public service motivation, being uh, general uh, support of public service, uh, two, self-sacrifice, and three, compassion, right? But that was with their original sample. Uh, we ran a Veramax rotated, iterated, principal factor analysis. Lots of big words to just tell you that we tested their hypotheses. And we found that actually it loaded onto uh, two specific dimensions where the service and sacrifice dimensions really became one dimension, right? And so the factor loadings, as you see here, for service and sacrifice, we found these items loaded on. And for compassion, we found these items loaded most predominantly onto compassion, right? And then that these three items loaded kind of evenly between the two. Discriminant validity between these two dimensions for the most part. So after we've measured PSM, right, uh, we also ask our subjects 
about five different organizations. And we asked them about the organizational missions in terms of the salience and the valence, right? And by salience, I mean the importance to them personally. So this is a more rational dimension of mission match, right? How much you identify with the mission of the organization. And then valence by how much you like the organization, right? So here's an example, the American Civil Liberties Union, right? Uh, we state the mission, and then we ask how important is the following mission statement to you personally. And by that, I mean how much you personally care about this issue, right? Then we ask them to what extent they agree that the ACLU does good for society, right? So it's important to measure both dimensions, we argue, because you might think the ACLU's mission in terms of civil liberties is really important, right? But you also might think that the ACLU is not the best organization uh, representing those particular interests, right? And indeed, when we run um, uh, correlations, we find that they're moderately correlated, about, uh, at about 0.65. It's high, but not, you know, not a perfect one, as you might expect, right? Then we expose our subjects to a simple reaction time task. And it's a very mundane, simple task, right? And we give them feedback on their performance for this task. So this is what they see. It, they're in front of a computer screen. And we say, you know, in this task, you will be given a fixation cross in the middle of your screen. And then a red dot will cover the cross. And when it does, press your space bar. And then we've recorded your reaction time, right? Very simple, very mundane. So this is what it looks like. Boom, space bar, right? That's it. And that, that happens at random intervals, right? For about, I think, uh, 20 trials through, through each, each task, so to speak. Then, after they do that, by the way, they don't even know why they're doing this. It's just part of the whole thing, right? right? And then after they're done, right, we say, OK, well, thanks for taking our survey. Thanks for doing the task. Please feel free to move on. However, if you would like to stick around and do this task again, and you can perform that task at the 99th percentile of performance, we will donate $10 to, and then we randomly assign one of the previously ranked organizations in terms of mission match, right? So now we've been able to exogenously impose a mission match on the individual. And they're working for this organization, quote unquote, working for this organization, completely for the organization and not for themselves. Because remember, they can leave, get paid just the same, or they can stick around and do this task for the organization, but only for the organization, only for the donation towards the organization, right? And if the subject fails to meet those expected performance, oh wait, I should show you the prompt. So we say, oh, your average reaction time for your simple reaction time task was this, right? Now you can click repeat, and you can do that again, $10 for charity, or if you don't want to do it, submit, and you get, you get your pay, right? If they do it again, and the subject fails to meet the expected performance, again, they're offered to play again, right? So you can guess what the dependent variable is here. How many times are they going to play this game right, on behalf of the organization wasting their own time, right? And by the way, they're given negative feedback in this, right? Your performance was not sufficient enough to uh, benefit whatever charity, whatever randomly assigned charity. Yes? Does, does your performance improve? I mean, is it all false feedback and do you improve it over time? Do they think they're getting better? They're always given their performance and they tend to improve incrementally. But uh, remember, this is a motor skill. And so there's not much variation from the third time that they play from the first time. Um, however, they do get used to the task a little bit. So you, we do see incremental improvements, right? And they do know how far they are away from the goal, right, each time they play. So they're told the 99th percentile, but they're also told the 99th percentile is this. And by the way, one second is not the average response time of one second is not representative. The average response time was somewhere near 0.25 seconds, right? This is me just doing, a, you know, like doing this so I could get to the screen and, and give you a screenshot, right? All right, so our sample was 250 workers from the United States 
who work in what's called Amazon's Mechanical Turk uh, environment. And what it is is a spot labor market, right? And these are people that uh, sit at home, sit at their office desk, whatever, and uh, they take on small tasks, small micro contracts to perform tasks for other people online, right? Could be you have you know, a five page document that you need a quick copy edit, right? You'll put that up on Mechanical Turk. You estimate that it would take somebody half an hour to copy edit. You would give them a rate you know, uh, appropriate to that half hour of time. And they can accept that contract or not, right? Well, it's a wonderful place to do behavioral experiments because you're giving people real tasks and in a real work environment, or at least a virtual work environment, right? Um, people have their sole you know, income derived from Mechanical Turk. And even if they don't have their sole income, it's a supplementary income that is, you know, in, you know, in theory, probably important to them, right? And so what we're able to do in this experiment with this real effort experiment in a virtual work environment is that we're able to establish causal validity with the random assignment of our organizational mission, right? But we don't substantially lose ecological validity, which is common with experiments, right? Because most experiments are like, oh, let's get some college students in a room and make them do these, you know, arbitrary tasks, right? But in a real work environment, when testing actual work efforts, you know, we don't lose as much ecological validity. I'm not saying that we don't lose some, obviously, right? But, you know, not as much of a substantial loss as other experimental settings. Our hypotheses here are that mission match increases the number of times that a real effort task is repeated, that PSM will strengthen this relationship, and importantly, a third uh, hypothesis is that this is going to be a nonlinear relationship. That if one is low, whether it's mission match or PSM, that you're not going to see as substantial of an increase if the other is high, right? A likelihood of more gains, right? That both of them have to increase together, and then it becomes an exponential increase in the number of games. So this is the number of times that the task was completed in our total sample, right? So out of 244 subjects, we lost six because they quit before they even got to the SRTT, right? But the number of times they played um, was once, 101. That means one time more than the base. And then two times, three times, and as you see, diminishing returns. Because, by the way, no one ever successfully completes it because it's the 99th percentile, right? So they're not dummies, you know. By, by about the fifth time, they're like, okay, I'm done with this, right? Well, one, one person. It's really <laughs> altruistic, okay? So I, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, this is showing you the models by specification in terms of just mission match, adding the first dimension of pu uh, public service motivation, the second, and then interacting these, right, all the way to a three-way interaction. And what we find is mission match is statistically significant across the board. That is, the more oriented you are with the mission of the organization, the more likely you are to repeat the task uh, and, and how many games you're willing to play. Um, the first dimension, this is the service slash uh, sacrifice dimension of PSM. Uh, we find is statistically significant when we get further specification in the model. Uh, the second of compassion is statistically significant across the board. And none of our two-way interactions are statistically significant, but our three-way interaction is, and in a negative sense, which uh, it's very hard to interpret this sort of thing, right? Uh, when you have so many interactions uh, intuitively just looking at the table. But I want to give you, uh, before I move on uh, from this table, I want to show you the controls, right? So just in case anybody's worried, well, did you account for this or account for that? These are the things that we did account for, and maybe you have some things that we should not have, but really, when you're working with experiments, you're really worried about the exogenous treatment anyway, and, and we have that exogenous treatment through our mission match. Nonetheless, we, we did uh, measure self-determination, right? How much of a go-getter they are. That wasn't uh, statistically significant. Actually, none of these are statistically significant in our model, and that could be the distance from the goal, right? 
Remember, we're telling them how far, uh, what their performance was and what's expected. And if they're really far from it, you might expect that they quit, that we'd have a negative coefficient with this, but we don't have any uh, statistical significance. Their ideology, their partisan identification. And remember, some people do this uh, as a side job. So we ask them if they have a job in the public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, self-employed, so on and so forth, right? We also, of course, ask their age, gender, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and important about their work environment, right? So hits are high intelligence tasks. That, that's what they call these micro contracts, right? And, and so we ask them how many hits they are performing right now. That is, sometimes people are on you know, two screens, you know, doing two different things at once. Uh, we ask them how many hits they do in an average day and how many hits they had done so far that day, right? And we find uh, no significance on any of these controls. So back to this, right? To give you a kind of a more intuitive interpretation of this. This is holding both of the PSM. This is like the kind of the starkest, you know, interpretation we can give you of this right now. Holding PSM, both the PSM dimensions at negative two standard devi deviations from the mean as low or both of the dimensions plus two standard deviations above the mean as high. Then you see moving mission match from negative two to two. You see the average number of games played based off of those predictions, right? And you see here that when PSM is low uh, versus when it's high, if mission match is low, yeah, you see a difference, but these right here, these are 95% confidence intervals, right? And we don't see actually a difference because if these confidence intervals overlap, that is if 0.46 is less than 0.51, which is the high, that means that we can't establish that these are statistically discriminant from one another, right? And so, statistically speaking, we don't see actually much of a change, right? When mission match is low, even though we've moved PSM from its very lowest to its very highest, right? But look at the stark difference when mission match is high, right? Then you see a three, uh, almost a two and a half game difference. And given that the mean for our average games played was like, you know, less than one, that's, that's pretty substantively significant, and it's also statistically significant, okay? And uh, graphically, you can kind of pick it out a little bit more, and you see this nonlinear kind of relationship, right? That it's not just, uh, you know, monotonic between all of these variables, right? That when mission match is high, or as mission match increases, right? And this is PSM1 at its highest, right? And PSM2 at its highest. We see this stark relationship. But uh, compare this, for instance, with, with that, right? Or, or any of the others. You see a, a very stark difference when both increase, right? Uh, you see that separation start to uh, kind of manifest, meaning that this is a, a mutually kind of um, beneficial relationship between these two particular um, intrinsic motivations. So the conclusion here is that mission match is a precondition to persistence and altruistic work behaviors. But public service motivation strengthens this relationship nonlinearly. And in other words, you might really have a highly altruistic person, right? Or you could have a highly motivated person in terms of their orientation to the mission of the organization, right? But neither motivation is going to lead to persistent altruistic initiative. That is, going above and beyond the expectations of one's role to benefit the organization, right? That these work in complement to one another. Now, if anyone is familiar with um, Downs and bureaucratic typologies, it is to say that it's neither the zealot right, of the organization in terms of the organizational mission, nor is it the statesman. It's, it's having both of these together, right? Someone that is very zealous over the organizational mission, but also is generically 
uh, you know, supportive of public service and altruism, right? That's going to lead towards these extra role behaviors. And this, has, this can speak a lot not just to you know, organizational behavior, but also theories of agency, right? Uh, delegation, right? We, we, of political control. We, uh, typically, they're not accommodating you know, uh, social psychological um, kind of precepts. We've been able to kind of exogenously uh, impose organizational mission on our analysis, which is very hard to do in organizational analysis, right? So before researchers can speak with much confidence about why public or NGO employees are able to persist in these type of environments, uh, we have to be able to say with some confidence what the basic theoretical mechanisms are that are, that are at work here, right? And in this study, we provide a pretty straightforward, but in, at least internally robust, and I would say a somewhat externally robust uh, research design. And, it, and hopefully it will provide some indication as to what those mechanisms are. Now, where are we going with this? Um, something I didn't tell you about this design is that we, so remember, they're hitting the space bar, right? Every time the cross comes up. And we're measuring the average time between when the cross comes up and a red dot covers, right? So how do you cheat at that game? Yes, right. Heejin had it right. Just keep pressing, keep pressing, right? Just, you know, like a machine gun staccato, right? Just keep pressing. And then uh, you'll, you, you know, you'll reduce your average response time between the cross and, and the red dot, right? Well, we told respondents, like, look, we know when you do this. Like, we, we can tell that you're tapping, like, because our program will count the number of taps, right? But even then, in fact, I think uh, of the six that we dropped, I think three of them still cheated, even though they were given this prompt, right? And they even, you know, in the open questions at the end, we asked, you know, why'd you stop, so on and so forth. And two of the cheaters even admitted, like, I just wanted to see if it was even possible to get this done. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I, 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 I appreciated their frankness. But the point is, is that, uh, is that three people cheated even when they were given that prompt. And so the next step in this research would be actually to see how these kind of intrinsic um, motivations are related to the willingness to cheat on behalf of the organization, right? If you're highly mission-oriented, mission-driven, right, would you be more teleological in your ethical compass as opposed to uh, being more deontological, right? Um, would you follow the rules that is deontological, uh, deontology, or would you be more about whatever it takes to get the job done, which is teleology, right? And so we're going to randomly assign the cheating prompt, right? So some will, some will be in a group that gets the prompt and others will get, be in an experimental group which doesn't get the prompt. So the treatment is actually lack of a, lack of a prompt, right? So that's one direction. Another direction is this concept of crowding out, how self-interest crowds out. So here's my buddy Al, altruistic, right? And so Al, Al has one failed attempt at this, right? And he's still Al. And he, but then he fails again, and he fails again, and he fails again, and again. And then eventually, he might get crowded out, right? And we want to know to what extent self-interest crowds out altruistic work behaviors when you're exposed to this negative feedback, right? And then finally, what you think versus what you say. Okay, so you remember the, you remember the scale of public service motivation, right? I tend to think of others when I'm doing a job. I, you know, it pains me to see others in need, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a potential for what they call social desirability bias in asking people those types of questions, right? Uh, only a sociopath would say, I don't care at all about other people when I do anything, right? I do everything for me. And even a sociopath would be smart enough to say, ah, this probably is not going to make me look too good. I'll at least go towards the middle of the scale here, right? And the point is, is that also your implicit motivations are going to be much different than your explicit motivations, right? That you're wired, kind of hardwired towards some things. And, and even though you might believe yourself to be 
one type of person and state it emphatically, how you actually are motivated, how you're psychologically wired might be different. And so there's been lots of tests to determine this separate from survey questions, separate from explicit elicitations, right, of your motivations that might be helpful in this field. And my colleague and I have developed one such test for pro-social motivation. So before I move on, if you'd like me to move on, I want to thank you for this, but I want to know if there's any questions regarding this particular design. And if we have some time after that, I'll, I'll show you one of the directions that we went with this. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, the negative, in terms of the negative feedback within uh, sort of a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of like some examples of what that would be. And I'm wondering, in particular, whether there's sort of different, differentiation between negative feedback for an individual, for a worker, mm -hmm. versus negative feedback for the organization. So something that the work, something, something that the person does that you know they didn't achieve with their goals or something, versus the organization didn't get a grant that they were working for, mm -hmm. or the organization didn't, they're an advocacy organization, they're trying to work towards something that they didn't necessarily achieve. So yeah. given the mission match, do they take those things on themselves as well as things that they do personally? Yeah, that's a great question and not one that I can address in this research. But uh, you're absolutely right. There is a difference between the two. I will say that performance uh, metrics have become very much in performance management arrangements in the public sector, at least, they become much more individualized with this expectation that, that the uh, um, that they, uh, that the parts become the whole, um, and so uh, and so there's a lot of attention paid to what individual bureaucrats are doing, um, more and more individualized outputs and, and programmatic outputs as opposed to their higher order objectives, right? Um, and then a tendency uh, in reaction to that for organizations to set goals that are kind of ambiguous and, uh, and outcome oriented so that they can avoid you know, blame, uh, so to speak. Um, sometimes they, it's a function of their mission. They can't uh, just rely on programmatically oriented goals. They have to set kind of outcome oriented goals. And uh, actually I'm doing some research related to that um, with a couple of my doctoral students, except uh, not really related to this particular research. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah um, my question is: so, what determines uh, how many times a person will do it? I was thinking about if you have a teenager at home mm -hmm. and they're so obsessed with re video games. Mm -hmm. The whole point of doing the game is to beat the system. Yeah. Right? Someone might be trying to think about it as a game that you're trying to ask them to solve and then they will feel really good if they can beat you mm -hmm. in terms of getting that whatever ten dollars. Doesn't matter where it goes to is winning the game that yeah. way. Would that be you? Well and so we try to accommodate that with measuring self determination, right? That that those types of people are those that have high self determination. Um, that they like to win, that they, that they will complete a task if it's put in front of them, so on and so forth. And we didn't find any, any significance with that particular variable. I'm sure there are better ways to measure it, um, except we didn't find them. Yeah. How much did you pay for the initial HIT relative yeah. to the charity? Say they pay 50 for the yeah. HIT, and you know, they can donate $10 of that mm -hmm. if they feel the need, if they're particularly charitable. And also, do you feel like your end gave you enough stratification by all the particulars, you know, the particular controls you were looking for? Yeah, so, um, yeah, with 250, I mean, we had reasonable degrees of freedom. I, uh, the analysis that you saw in terms of graphical and, and, and uh, were all based off of the most parsimonious model. Right, uh, that is the one that only had all the interactions and none of the controls. But uh, as you saw, the coefficients were, or I can show you again, the coefficients were basically the same across models, so it didn't really matter. Um, but um, in terms of payment, uh, I believe we paid five dollars per, which is well above market rate because it, it was an average of 13 minutes to complete the task. 
And so you figure that's about $20 an hour, which is great pay for a Turker who are typically paid on a rate of minimum wage, national minimum wage rate. Um, and we did that for two reasons. One was ethical. Um, I don't, I, and, and two, we wanted them to not see so much disparity between the donation to the organization as to, as to their own. Task. We don't think that relatively high rate already gives you a selection because or, or, or are all of them just going to automatically go to the high? Well, I mean, if, uh, if yeah, well, we also, we also screened at uh, those that, and so Turkers have a rating, right? And we screened at a 90% rating, so and meaning that we got the best Turk workers, or Turkers, so to speak. That's right, that's right. And this, I mean, I mean, MTurk in, in and of itself is, you know, a convenient sample. Like, you can't randomly assign these, they have to select the tasks, right? But we did select the highest workers for a good rate, or the highest performing workers for a good rate, yes? Uh, so on that, was there a, a total time limit for how long they could spend on the task itself? And also, could they accept the contract get a feel for the game and then exit the contract but re-enter? No, they couldn't, they couldn't exit and re-enter. Um, uh, was there a time limit on how long they could be doing it? Um, no. I could go back to see how long they were taking, except um, they would have to be stuck on one of those, you know, repeat or submit screens in order for that to happen, right? Either that or they'd have to stop in the middle of the survey. If they stopped in the middle of the survey, we don't really care. Actually, I don't think we really care regardless because it is a, uh, uh, oh yeah, so you're saying, oh, they could set it aside and come back and like donate on their own time? Well, what I, what I was thinking is what, if they were particularly hell-bent on beating you or yeah. giving the $10, yeah. is that they could sit there, write a program, um, to basically look for any change on their display and then input at a random <laughs> interval less than 0.1. Okay, all right. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say that that would be the outlier of our, of our population. <laughs> okay. Um, yes? Um, I'm curious as to when the three, out, three students were doing the tapping or doing the consistent, like, you know, tapping for the, for the cheaters. Yeah. And they weren't students, they were Turkers. They could have been a student, but yeah. Um, and they, um, did they start doing that like from the beginning or when they discovered that, like, oh, I'm gonna. Well, two, I, I don't know, but two of them, two of them did it, you know, after they, after they did it like two or three times. Oh, after they yeah, that yeah, that's right. But those, remember, were not included in our final analysis sample, right? Uh, because we discluded them because of the cheating. Right, but if we had included them, uh, I mean, they would have been repeat performers, whether or not they were motivated or not. I don't know. Yeah. But that's yeah, that's only two people, so I doubt it would have affected it substantially. So, uh, do you want to hear about this little extension of it? Okay, so we're um, the the. The thing that we're worried about is, again, the social desirabil desirability bias, right? And so we wanted to, we developed a measurement instrument for pro-social motivation, which is very much a correlated construct to uh, public service motivation. And it's more parsimoniously measured with only four survey items as opposed to 12, right? Um, and we wanted to develop one that wasn't susceptible to this social desirabil desirability bias, right? But um, we had to, in order to develop this instrument, you know, when you develop a new measurement instrument, there's a lot of validity tests that you have to put it through, right? And so we have done quite a lot of validity testing on this instrument. And I'm going to show you one of the validity tests, and that's predictive validity. And then I'll show you some indications of that crowding out you know, question that I was talking about. But to let you know, we also tested this in terms of known groups validity. That is, do the people that we suspect would be more pro-social, are they going to register higher on our scale than those that don't, right? And we tested it in terms of its resistance to pro-social appeals. So we, we gave them actually a commercial 
for, um, uh, for Peace Corps with Matthew McConaughey um, in the background. And he says, Did, would you go 10 miles to help someone? How about, how about 1,000 miles? You know, how about 10,000 miles? You know, and uh, shows all these like, very pro-social appeals of like, people like, you know, with poor children and you know, tears and you know, violins playing and everything, right? Um, and we see if, it's, if our measurement instrument is susceptible to those types of appeals. We, I, mean, I know it's a weak test, but, but we find durability to those types of appeal, appeals. And then in terms of the known group's validity, we actually tested masters of public administration students and MBAs from three different schools, uh, present company might have been included. And then, uh, and then also a general population. And it mapped out as we thought that MPAs register very high in terms of pro-social motivation, this implicit pro-social motivation, MBAs very low, and the general population mapped somewhere in the middle um, for, for the most part. But that's not what I'm going to cover here. What I'm going to tell you is kind of make an argument for this implicit versus explicit motivation, right? So we have attitudes about the world, the people around us, and ourselves. And they lie outside of our conscious awareness. Uh, these un unconscious or implicit attitudes play a role in our decision making and behavior. You can think of implicit racial bias, right? I, I have no, nothing against, you know, a person of color, right? Uh, you can say that till, you know, the cows come home but your actual actions, how do they reveal themselves, right? And you can believe that, too. It's not to say you, you just might be, you know, wired with, with an inherent bias, uh, inherent political attitude, an inherent self-concept, right? An implicit self-concept, such as how much you are a team player. You might really believe you're a team player, right? And you can say it all you want. And if somebody's asking you, are you a team player, you'll be like, yeah, definitely. Except when, you, when you're in a team setting, your behaviors might indicate differently. And these are these implicit motivations that we're talking about, or attitudes, right? So implicit attitudes, right, are automatic. They're uncontrolled. They're not accessible to introspection. They're more stable than explicit attitudes. You ask somebody how they feel about something one day that might be different um, they might tell you something different the next day, right? They're also very difficult to capture, unfortunately, right? Um, they're not measurable using our standard survey approaches, whereas explicit attitudes much, are much more easily measured, right? And explicit attitudes are controlled. They're deliberate. You think about them before you state them, and you can articulate them, right? Uh, but they're more susceptible to faking, right, and satisficing and social desirability than our implicit attitudes are, right? So think of explicit racial tolerance versus implicit racial bias. Think of pro-social motivations, right? I want to help other people, right? And I can say that as I'm walking over somebody that's lying in the street. So we have these explicit survey measures that test these constructs of public service motivation, right, and of pro-social motivation, and they're, and they're both very well validated, right? And they have predictive validity, as I just showed in the previous study. So it's not to diminish the importance of explicit pro-social or public service motivations, right? Often when you say something, then you say, well, I just said it. I should act that way, you know? But it's still a, a, a different concept or construct than your implicit attitude or motivation, right? So we have developed a, an implicit association test to measure pro-social motivation. Now, pro-social motivation is this desire to help other people, the other regarding orientation, willingness to, uh, or desire to put needs of society before the needs of oneself, the motivation to do good for others and shape that well-being in society. Very much related to what we were just talking about with public service motivation, right? But a little bit more generically altruistic, right? So what does this implicit association test look like? Well, it's a reaction time task 
Kind of like the simple reaction time task that I showed you that we gave them as a generic task, right? But this is word association, right? And like the canonical example of an implicit association test, and you can look up if you go, uh, I think it's iat.harvard.edu. Uh, there are some researchers that have developed implicit association tests for different types of construct, including implicit racial bias, right? And this is kind of the canonical example of the use of an IAT, is that whether you know, people more strongly associate African Americans with good words or whites with good words, right? And typically, the IAT is taken online in, on a computer, right? And so the structure of the implicit association test is separated into blocks, right? And so the first block, they'll sort the categories into one configuration where African Americans are associated, you, you are told you are going to be given bad words, right? Bad valence, uh, words with bad valence, right? Like ugly, nasty, so on and so forth, right? And you must, you know, make an association with African Americans when those words pop up, right? And then it's reversed, right? Then in the second block, then you have good words associated with African Americans or whites, you know, vice versa. It doesn't matter which is first, right? And what we're doing is seeing what your motor skills are, right? But your motor skills are coming from your implicit biases that we will find a tendency for you to have trouble associating good or bad words with one of the different constructs, right? And, and the delay towards one construct versus another is a measurement of your implicit bias, right? And it's not your left hand versus your right hand or you know, your eyesight and your right or your left or anything like that because the blocks are randomly assigned, the associations of the words are randomly assigned over several iterations, right? So for our pro-social implicit association test, we do something similar, right? This is the prompt that they're given to begin. You'll be presented with a set of words to classify into categories. Please classify the words as quickly as you can um, without, uh, while making as few, as few mistakes as possible. Going too slow or making too many mistakes will result in an uninterpretable score. The following is a list of categories and the words that belong to each of those categories. And so with service, Compassion, sacrifice, duty, give, helping, with profit, gain, win, money, take, capitalize. And then you're expected to either associate these words with yourself or with others, right? So this would be what the subject would see, right? So helping would pop up. And in this particular block, they're supposed to associate words of service with themselves, right? And so they would say, I'm going to press E, right, on my keyboard, because it's on the left-hand side, to bring helping you know, over with that category. And then they're randomly switched throughout each block, right? So here's an example of how it plays out, if I can do this. So me, you know, E, capitalize, I, so on and so forth. And they come up about that fast and you're pressing as fast as you can, right? And all we're doing is measuring, you know, how long it takes you, and also the number of mistakes that you might make, right? So we do almost the same experiment, right? But we're interested in how much uh, implicit pro-social motivation can explain or predict the amount of money that an individual will give to an organization, as opposed to how many times they'll play. So in this particular experiment, it's almost the same design, but at the end, instead of just playing for somebody else, right, wholly, you get $10 and you get to choose how much you're going to give to the organization that's randomly assigned, by the way, we're still accounting for a random mission match, right? But you get to decide how much money you're going to give to the organization versus how much money you're going to keep for yourself out of $10. And again, they're paid $5. So this is, now, now there's real stakes, right? Because they could double their money, triple their money, right? Uh, they're also not 
exposed to the 99th percentile. We do do, we're, we're interested in another uh, you know, iteration of this, or basically another paper uh, using this design. We, uh, we randomly assign them to two uh, task difficulty groups, right? One is at the 90th percentile, one is at the 50th percentile. But 90th percentile, of course, is a lot more achievable than the 50th percentile, okay? But for the purposes of this presentation, all I want to do is talk about does our IAT have predictive validity? That is, can we show that it predicts, you know, that uh, a person is more likely to, or is likely to give more money the higher they register in implicit pro-social motivation, right? and test it against explicit pro-social motivation and explicit public service motivation. So, you know, same, same design. We do the EPSM, the EPRO, and various demographic and ideological characteristics. We do the organizational missions by, by um, valence and salience. And then we do the pro-social IAT, right, that you just saw. And then the simple reaction time task, same as last time, right? And now they're offered to play again, but now they get this drop down. What portion of your worker bonus would you like to donate to the World Wildlife Fund if in fact you complete the task according to the expectations that we've set? And the two different groups randomly assigned, 50th percentile and 90th percentile, right? So accounting for all that, we had 528 workers from uh, MTurk again. Um, and for the purposes of this, we're primarily interested in the differences between IPRO, implicit pro-social motivation, and explicit measures. And so first, you know, just a simple correlation table, we do see there's discriminative validity between this, right? They are somewhat correlated, you know, implicit pro-social motivation is somewhat correlated with these two constructs, right? And to go back to my earlier argument that these two are a lot like one another, these are both highly correlated at 0.67. But, and this is getting rid of all the controls and whatnot, just showing you that implicit pro-social motivation actually has more statistical predictive validity than either explicit pro-social motivation or public service motivation. Now, and by the way, these are highly correlated, but I can tell you if you drop one out or another, like it makes no difference, okay? And then mission match, of course, is also explains how much money they're going to give to the organization as well. But this is controlling for that mission match, right? So uh, to go on to that one other hypothesis of crowding out, and this is just some preliminary evidence, we do see that the donation amount over time, as they are failing, right, tends to diminish, right? So the bigger circles are how many people are, are still part of our sample, right? And so one would actually be one more game over the baseline SRTT that they took, you know, to establish their baseline performance, right? And then between the two groups, the difficult goal versus those that were assigned to an easy goal, actually we see those that are assigned to the difficult goal uh, stay pretty consistent, don't crowd out as much. Uh, these two do, except you're, at this point you're talking about like two people out of our 528, right? Whereas we see a more of a crowding out effect after the three games with, with this group, right? Um, and again, less substantial numbers but at the end. But this is just preliminary evidence because we're, not, we're talking about uh, between group crowding out or, or, or within group crowding out but we're not talking about within individual, right? So some, this isn't accounting for how much an individual might donate at game one versus when they get to game three. Did they reduce, did they change their donation? Because they have the opportunity to change that donation in every single iteration. Uh, the problem with that is specification, right? Because we've got people dropping out at different times throughout these 10 iterations, right? And so, we have, to, uh, we have to account for that. And we think that we do have a good model for that, except we're, we're just now get, you know, specifying that model. So the conclusion for this is that our measure of implicit pro-social motivation indicates both discriminant and predictive validity. And this complements previous tests establishing known groups validity 
that is MPAs versus MBAs in general population, and stable resistance to pro-social appeals, although of course that was one weak test of resistance to pro-social appeals. We have to get somebody besides Matthew McConaughey narrating the next one. Um, preliminary analysis uh, regarding the crowding out effect, right? Um, and now we're ready to take this into the real world too, right? So we're doing some studies using this instrument at USC School of Medicine in terms of uh, specialization selection, right? So those specializations such as general um, practitioner or uh, pediatricians are more pro-social in, in nature in that they, they have a lot more hands-on care with patients, right? they also tend to be the lowest paying of all specializations, right? And so does you know, this implicit pro-social motivation explain why medical students select into certain specializations over others? Um, this is the same is true with Chicago area. Um, a, a friend of ours, Emily Steele at uh, Illinois Chicago, she is uh, looking at certified nursing assistants, and there we're trying to measure how implicit, uh, implicit pro-social motivations are associated with burnout in that job, right? Because there's a lot of caring for individuals that's necessary within that job. Also with uh, Carmen uh, Meradian and Frank Zarunian and hopefully a couple other um, uh, people, we're going to be uh, testing this in California municipalities with local government workers and with LAUSD teachers, and also across cultural contexts. So we're translating the instrument, see if it's working in other cultural contexts, such as Germany and the Netherlands, and that's with uh, some of my friends at Speyer University and others. So, and now that is it, but uh, I'd love to answer questions about this. Yes. So when you uh, were doing the predictive validity table, the four uh -huh. specific things, I saw your N was like 387 relative to your initial 528, and then, and then it was in between those two for the previous. Was it people dropping out, or were you stratifying? This is the donation amount. So they, so, so about you know, some of them chose not to donate at all, right? Or, or show, well, actually chose not to do the task again, right? And so. You could see that. I mean, I guess uh, theoretically you could, you could conceptualize that as I'm not going to donate, but then that's also saying that I'm not going to try to win money for myself, right? So. But, and I assume, yeah, okay, that's why you, you took them out yeah. in this stage. And in the previous one, you had a difference of like 30 or 40 people, and that was because people just didn't complete the. Yeah, that's right. Yes, for 473. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seemed higher non completion. Previous one. Yeah. No, I mean you're observing. Yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah, I I can't explain the dropouts. Um, and and I mean I mean you bring up a good point. Anytime you you have that high number of dropouts, you should be definitely doing some uh, diagnostics uh, to make sure that there's no kind of systematic reason for dropping out and controlling that in your model, and we will. But um, like I said, we're just at the stage of doing these specifications for the crowding out thesis. So yeah. Maybe Bill, you can uh, explain, say, a doctoral student wants to consider doing similar kind of experiment. What are the basic knowledge, logistics in terms of software, the kind of program they can use to get started? Yeah, so um, I will say it's not cheap, right? Um, it, it can be expensive to run these types of experiments. Um, I have a three-year license for the software that does the simple reaction time tasks, and that three-year license costs me, I don't know, several thousand dollars, right? Um, but you get a lot of traction out of that, right? And when I say several, a couple thousand dollars, okay? And, um, and then you have to pay all your subjects as well, right? Uh, now the Turkers are a little bit cheaper than students, um, and for the purpose of purpose of work efforts, um, I mean like trying to do real effort experiments as they relate to work contexts, it's uh, as I argue uh, uh, more of a virtual you know, workplace, right? So uh, has a little bit more ecological validity. So there's, that's good, right? Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out how you think, especially if you haven't thought out the experiment very well, right? And so my, my argument to you is to know your theory 
extremely well, right? And also pay attention to measurement. Um, you know, knowing how to do a two-stage model, you know, uh, knowing how to do maximum likelihood estimation, all that's going to come afterwards, right? You can run the models afterwards, right? So your statistical sophistication is one thing, but it's really about research design. And knowing your theory and knowing how to measure properly, that is important, especially in experimental contexts. Um, but I would argue in any, any type of research. Yes? Do you plan to move outside of turpers and really kind of do the same type of thing on people who are in more altruistic roles already? That's right. So, um, so in these, right, in California municipalities, in these CNAs, in the medical schools. Is that going to be the exact same test? Or I wasn't sure. Some ty uh, yeah, I mean, some types of tests. Um, so I obviously can't exogenously impose an organizational mission in those contexts, right? But what I can do is I can measure their implicit pro-social motivation, and I can expose them to different types of experimental tests in their surveys, right? So um, I don't want to get into that because, uh, frankly, it hasn't been implemented yet. And I, I mean, there will be two people besides my mother that will watch this, except I don't want one of those two people to be uh, any of those potential subjects. So <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you again to the Bedrosian Center for the support.